Additional funding was provided by Friends of Iowa Public Television. Just perfect. The light is just excellent. Professionally, I am a designer for Hallmark. I design for the cards that we do photographically and either design them or do the photography myself or direct it. It's been one of those things I've had a lot of fun doing for the last 42 years. Over the years, Dick has come to our garden to make pictures for his cards. Here are several of them. And what I learned was that he didn't come just to take pictures of the gardens, but to bring his prop. That's his chair and his basket. One day, he even brought an old table, garden gloves, his own plants, birdhouses, all kinds of things. And he spent hours arranging them. He is a stylist, and he's trying to create a story with his pictures. He even got me to help him with a flower arrangement. I've been making bouquets for years, but Dick really has the touch. I learned so much just from watching. Here's the card that came from that bouquet. Lots of fun. Well, I bet you can guess that Dick is a gardener too. He invited us to come visit, and we did twice. It was something to see how he arranged his garden. Like his pictures, everything is organized and designed. He gardens in pots, on a patio, and he furnishes the gardens with all kinds of architectural details. Here are some of the cards that he's made of his garden. He has fountains. And in this one, you can see something of his style. Well, you know, lots of times people are asking me, how do you make a garden interesting? Uh, I think you make a garden interesting by having architectural elements throughout the garden that seem like they have a reason for being there. I, I always try to keep an open mind what can I bring to the garden that looks new and fresh that I can put with the flowers or the flowers in it or the flowers on it or the flowers by it? And, uh, you know, my favorite haunts are junk shops, architectural salvage places. Uh, when we used to photograph in St. Louis, I always made a trip at least one or two weekends to go through all those wonderful, wonderful salvage places from all those old homes in St. Louis. In fact, I've been looking for 12 years for a special gate when we moved to this house to create a whole entrance to the garden. And, uh, you know, on the walls, I, was, I was, went in this architectural salvage place, and on the walls, all of a sudden, right in the corner, next to a stairwell, I, I spotted the perfect thing. And it wasn't in the best of shape. I mean, it was missing pieces here and missing pieces there. But I noticed there was two pieces, and one, one part had the part I need, and the other one had the other parts I needed. And then when we found the third part, we had enough to make a gate. And then, of course, then I found the perfect welder, and we sat down with my sketch, and in five hours, we had the gate and created the, the, uh, the, the whole business. And then I designed the, uh, the bricks and the finials to go on the top and the wrought iron fence to go with it. And, you know, after 12 years of searching, I had all the components to make the entrance to the garden that I'd been looking for for a long, long time. Okay, Dick, what's the first thing you did? Well, we had these antique brick. Okay. And I knew eventually we would do an antique driveway. Okay. So I planned this walkway so that it follows along where we have flowers. Okay. And as you're going, you, you know that there's Maybe something special going to happen. A gardener lives here. Yeah. And th the, main, the main thrust was that when a guest comes, the first thing they're going to see it's are the, the flowers in the pots uh -huh. and the flowers on the doors. Okay. And then you sort of think, there's going to be something special. Okay, let's go see. And when you open the doors... The garden. Yes. yes. It's just beautiful. The layout of the house just brings you right in, doesn't it? Yeah. This is what the guests see. Uh -huh. But more important, when Jill and I come down that stairway in the morning, 
This what's we, this is what we see. This makes our day. I can understand and that. And when I come home in the evening, I'm thinking, I'm going to be out there, and we're going to have dinner on that patio. Wonderful. Oh, Dick, it's just gorgeous. Sorry about the rain. I thought I heard thunder. <laughs> but, hey, it, the, the colors, even with a little rain shower, they just sort of glow. Oh, they absolutely do. This seems like there's so much going on here. How do you manage? I don't really have a lot of time to spend on this garden. I mean, okay. I, I have to be very honest. Uh, there are a, a lot half of flowers here, though. A half hour a day is really about my limit. Okay. I get up at 6 o'clock, and, you know, this is one of seven garden rooms. Okay. So you just have to be kind of managed, and it has to be watered every day. Okay. Um, you know, this little garden here, which you see, could be in a little pocket garden in Charleston. Right. Or it could be on the 54th floor of a penthouse in New York City. But so, so much satisfaction yeah. in a small space. Well, and it's designed so... One, when you come down in the morning, you see this. When you're over here having dinner in the evening, you see this. Right. You know, it's, it's that intimate little fun kind of thing. Now, to me, you've got all these different levels, and it's almost like sculpture. How is it planted? This is all in pots. Oh, my. This is a handsome one. Yeah. Now, that's, that's one of those wonderful Japanese um, uh, porcelain-covered pots that they use, I think, probably for uh, bonsai. So that before the plants are big, the pots are important, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, because everything here is terracotta except for these two, which give you the entrance to the garden, and it's that wonderful, wonderful dark blue that, you know, it's that Japanese dark blue. Okay, I'm not seeing pots, but how many do you think are under here? Oh, at least 30. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's at least 30. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but over here, the, the pots are a feature, aren't they? Oh, yeah, well, there and over here, because uh, those and are I, really nice French uh, wrought iron pots. They're and, handsome. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Th those are... And they also carry the black, the wrought iron in, in the garden furniture, too. And, of course, the centerpiece. This is beautiful. Well, actually, right? well, you know, yeah. actually, the garden design really began around this. This is the first thing we did, and we had a few little flowers here, and it's kind of grown from there. This is the centerpiece. Right. This is the okay. centerpiece. It's designed, so we have the, this year, of course, the feature plant is the scaviola, and it's coming down. Okay. Now, we still have the pink vining uh, verbena coming down. Now, last year... This was all pink. Okay, that but was a this year, and so over the years you changed things. Right. Okay. okay. But I see cardinal vine. Right. The cardinal vine is planned for here, and of course when you come back, this will all be in those wonderful little red blooms that are just just terrific. Now it wants to climb. Where's it going to go? Where are these going to go? Okay. Uh, what I do uh -huh. is, Let me get you and here. I see I've got a few here to do. Uh, I very carefully weave these back down. Okay. So you each are, morning yeah. I kind of go through there, and when I see somebody coming up. I tuck them back down because I really want to keep that confined down here. Now, later on in the season, I'll go ahead and let them up. And they'll right peek now, through. Yeah. But I, right now, I, when these are all in bloom, I want this wonderful collar of red. Okay. And then we have this collar on the top, almost like a purple ice cream cone. So what we're going to have here is really like a fountain of color. And I think you are sculpting this. You're not letting these plants right, do their right, thing. No, you're, you're working with them. Right. And I also love the verticals. These are strong. These are mandevillas. Right. And on really good structure, right? Yeah. 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 Well, the, uh, a wrought iron artist in North Carolina designed these for our garden. So in the wintertime, you have this wonderful black wrought iron. Right. And in the center here is the stone fruit. Okay. So we've got something to see in the wintertime. I think it's important when you're thinking about your garden. Yeah. You want something to look at in the yeah. winter. We've got, because we're, that, that wind is still there. Okay. But now what I'm impressed with most right now is this blue, and it's throughout the whole garden. Just masses of it here, even by the front door. Right. This is that, one of the new annuals, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's scaviola. Okay. It sounds like a disease. Yeah, it sure yeah. does. <laughs> and I love the combination, because I love the little foliage plants with the polka dots all the color and at our house you dug this out of the ditch yeah that, this, this is this is greater ditch material <laughs> that's great because it's a it, it feels like a really sophisticated garden but you have very strange plants even the kale i just love it see i don't know why they call this horsetail but actually here we've got one of the very newest hybridized plants in the world and here is probably one, one of the, of the old, very the oldest, oldest living plants in the world. And it gives you great line yeah it's fine it's okay fine. now do you call this done you'll just take care of it this no summer? i tell you what since you're here in town, uh, I want you to join me. We've got a wonderful Victorian white wrought iron and wire plant stand, which hasn't gotten planted yet. Well, I see, when I saw it, I thought, well, that's just nice, a sculpture. But you have plans. Yeah, you have plans. So why don't we, why don't we get into our grubbies and let's, let's do a okay, little planting. Okay, sounds good, sounds good.
the reason why I don't have this done, Karen, is it was a bit rusty. And I just plain wanted to get the rust off and get it painted properly for the summer. This is the fountain that I think you have a painting upstairs about. Yeah, yeah. I did that for Jill for her birthday a couple years ago because I wanted her to have something of the garden in the wintertime uh, to remind her what the summer was like. What I do here is I always put the saucers down first. Well, you put the three big saucers up on the top, then three big saucers, then three small saucers on either side. Okay. Now, you do this, why? Well, for one thing... To keep the... I want to I want to keep the uh, plant stand as, as clean as possible. Okay. And also, it helps in the watering, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Uh, because then the, the water, uh, you have a chance for the plants to absorb even more during the right. day, right? Uh, now, I don't do that there on the big the deck, simply because... I, I don't care where the water runs. Okay. Here I'm trying to keep this, you know, the, the rust problem down. However, if we have a lot of rain, what have you, I pull these out because then the plants get too much and then then, then you're jeopardizing the plants. Right. Okay. And Next comes the pots on the top. Okay. Three big ones on the top. All right. Then we put three big ones on this next level. Aren't you clever? There are pot shards already in these yes. pots. Hey. You, when you do as many pots as I do, you have it all organized. Okay, I always impressed. the pot shards in there, and you always do a pot shard because that way the pot, when the water and fills up with dirt, and as as you as the days go along and the months go along, you're still draining properly. Right. Yeah, and nothing's plugging that hole. Right. Yeah. Great. And then we're gonna have three three little small ones, ones on the bottom, on and then I side. always hold back one to dip dirt for the okay. rest of the pots. Now you see, I would never do this. I think I'd fill the pots and plant them first, but this is the way of organizing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, the reason for it is it just goes back to habit. On the deck, you've got these big pots. You sent me a slide that showed, yes. and so you arrange your pots? I arrange the pots just the way I want them. Then I fill them with the dirt. Just like you here. On location, right okay. where you're going to be. Okay. For two reasons. One, they're heavy. Okay. There's no sense in moving <laughs> them two or three times. Uh-huh. And you can really see and move them around yeah. easier before they're full of dirt. Right. Yeah, yeah. And oh. then what I do, then I start planting one by one. Okay. And you, as you see on the, on the right side of the slide, you see I've planted these. The urn is planted. We've also got the, the two big topiaries are just beginning to be planted. Okay. And you can see on the left side there how all of the dirt, it's every just location, waiting. Yeah, it's, it's just, just waiting. waiting for me to put the, the flowers in. Okay. Good soil. It's just more here. efficient that way, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, okay. and it's a special soil mix. Okay. Okay. I don't feel like I'm doing much, but you've also planned the colors, too. As you right. tell them, right, that this is, in your mind, you've got a concept for this. Right. Okay, so give me a, give me an idea of what's going to happen okay. here. This is going to be pink and white. Okay. Then in here is going to be blue, kind of bringing up the blue from, from all the, other. the other rest of the garden. And then along the sides here are going to be salmon. Oh, great. And this ties into the salmon that's that's also throughout the garden. Throughout the garden. Okay. If you haven't guessed it, we like color. I think so. Yeah. And the planter is beautiful. And you've yeah. got you're trying to really show the planter off right. and the plants, aren't you? Yeah. Well, and um, you'd be surprised. Uh, you probably think why why don't why we put, so few pots? Yeah. Why okay, so few, few pots? pots. Well, and it's because they're going to get big. Right? Yes. Now we're going to be planting some some uh, begonias in here. But now look, this is... Uh, How big yeah. any one plant's going to be. Yeah, and actually, they'll, okay. when you get back, you'll find that they're even bigger than this. Okay, let's get... Let's yeah. see. I want to do some planting. Let's okay. see how this goes. So first you fill everything with dirt. Right. Okay. That'll do it for the pots. Uh, why don't we pull the uh, salmon in patience, okay. and we'll start off with them. Okay. Now, now, these what are four I, what packs, I, yeah. What I do, okay. before I ever put anything into the pots, I try to unlock the roots. Mm -hmm. That way, we spread it out so that we put it in the pots and we kind of shove it in. The dirt will push these roots out so they will grow faster. Same thing I do with perennials in the garden. Okay, Same, me, okay, I, okay I, in the pot. I, I, okay, me. now you're using trowel. Yeah, I, I, I part the saw with the trowel, then I get it all set. And then I come back and get a little bit more dirt mm -hmm. to put right around the top. Okay. And I keep it pretty loose. And then after I'm all finished, 
Then I will water them all so that we for sure have got enough moisture. Okay. Can I try one? Sure. Okay. You do one too. I'm going to use my hand. Is that okay? Yeah. Instead of the trowel. Just break those roots, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I try to unlock them from underneath. Well, you know. Show me what you mean. Okay. Right in here, these roots are the last roots to go. Okay. So when I unlock them, I try not to break too many of them, but I do want to get them spread. Okay. You want to get that bottom? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that when I, when I stuff it into the pot, uh -huh. then we, we've exposed as many roots as we can without breaking as many as we can. Okay. Now, are you going to let us come back and see how this turns out? Yes. Okay. Oh, hey, okay. Listen, of course Great. you do. Well, we better get it planted. Right? Well, this garden is kind of unique in that much of it is in pots. And, of course, when it's in pots, uh, I have to, I water it every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. And being that the Midwest can get very hot, sometimes in the summertime we'll be 95 to 100 or 105 degrees. Jill kind of looks out at noon and decides whether it needs a second watering. And on those windy hot days, it may get a third watering at around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. When I'm watering, I try not to hit the blossom. I try to water the pot. And I try to water the pot so that uh, if this were the top of the pot, I try to fill that up with water so that we, that water is going to go all the way down and those roots are going to go down. We're not watering just the surface. We're, we're wanting that water to go all the way through. So we're very sure we, we have um, a good base at the bottom of that pot that's going to keep it from drowning. So that, that water, I put the water on the top and the water goes all the way through and comes out the bottom. Every Saturday is fertilizer day. Uh, we do a fertilized watering. On Saturday, everything is watered just as it is during the week, except there's fertilizer in the water. And I use the fertilizer that we spray this time, the blossoms and the leaves get sprayed, because the fertilizer is actually doing as much into the leaves as it is going into the roots of the plant. With the fertilizer I use, it is a liquid fertilizer, it's mild. I can put it on once a week, and I haven't burned anything, and they love it. When you grow things in the Midwest, it can be kind of touchy. Uh, it can be very difficult here because we can get cold quickly, and we can get very, very hot in the summertime, but you know that can be kind of a crutch, too. I can remember when we were photographing in Bouchard's Gardens, and I thought, oh, gee, many the flowers here, acres and acres. It must be just a, you know, a real hoot to grow things here. It must be so easy. And much to my surprise, he says, you know, it's very difficult growing things here. Uh, you would think it wasn't. But you know, uh, what you do is you plan your palette, you plan your plants to the, to the surroundings that you've got to grow in. I grow things here that will work in the Midwest that uh, are going to be beautiful. I don't try to get out there on the edge because I don't have time. You know, if I was here all day long and I didn't have a job and I could kind of, oh, it's getting a little too hot today. We'll, we'll run it inside real quick. <laughs> That's not one of those things I can do. So it, it, it has to stay out there and it has to take the heat. Like this gaviola we put this year. When we were down at, at Disneyland in Epcot, I said, ooh, this plant is just gorgeous. And I says, how is it? Well, we have it here because we get so hot in the sunshine down here. I said, ah, that's going to be perfect for my garden. I know just exactly where to put it because I've got a spot where that sun beats down all day long, and it's right in the middle of the garden. It's important, and it works beautifully. But you got to have the right kind of drainage. I took that same plant and did it as a border plant. Didn't do very well because we weren't draining the water off enough. Well, the vining verbena we have uh, over the years have kind of narrowed it down to the pink vining ver verbena. You know, I love the purple. The purple is gorgeous. In fact, I would have to say the purple is probably my choice. However, I've also found in the hot summer days, it doesn't hold up as well. Now, what I do do, and it still kind of gives the same color, is I use the purple vining lantana. So we have two big pots of that, and, you know, they're gorgeous. They're enormous. The cardinal vine is a uh, favorite of my daughter's. So we planted some in a pot to go over the fence, and then we planted some to go in the big urn. But it really kind of doesn't start blooming until maybe the latter part of August or the first part of September. But you have these gorgeous feathery leaves all summer long. It's a neat, neat plant. 
I use the stone crop sedum as a tie-in throughout the garden, and I use it also in pots so that it plugs in. Actually, the, the pots, by the end of summer, you won't even know that there's pots underneath that huge garden. It's because of the almost like a mat of these wonderful, tiny, little, shiny, bright green leaves. The mandevilla plant is a tropical plant. Uh, we can only put it in the area of the garden that we get sunshine. So how do we use it? Because my wife just absolutely loves those blossoms. We put in three plants in these large urns, and by the end of the summer, it will be at least, uh, at least six feet tall. If I run a fishing pole up, I can go up to nine or 10 feet. And last week, we had 42 blossoms on one of the plants. We, again, it's one of those things we fertilize once a week. Well, you know, the begonias and the impatience, I am sure, are one of those flowers that a lot of gardening aficionados would kind of turn their nose up at, oh, well, they're so ordinary. But you know, in my garden, I have a lot of shade. And they are just an absolute must. They are the, the backbone of my garden. So how do I make it look new and fresh? It's the way I choose the colors. It's the way I put it together. It's what I mix with them so that you're not that conscious that they're begonias and impatience. Um, you have to, if you want a lot of color, and I like a lot of color. Now, some people are, well, they're going to have a, a perennial that blooms once, you know, two or three weeks or what have you. If I have perennials in my garden, I want something that's going to be there for like maybe a month, month and a half, two months, because I'm doing a color block. I want that color statement to be made. And when I plan the garden, like I will have old-fashioned flocks because they'll take the heat. They last longer. You fertilize them, they can get up as high as six feet. When that is dying and dead, then I come in for the false dragon stews with the same color, with that same purple. So I still carried in that section of the garden that same color block that I want to be there. When we're entertaining, we, uh, we kind of make it a little bit more special. We, uh, when we're sitting out here for, uh, for dinner in the evening, it's on the wrought iron chairs. And when company comes, we, we dig out the green and white padded seats, and uh, we put up the, the green canvas umbrellas, and we bring out the silver and the crystal. And uh, even though there's lots of flowers here, sometimes it kind of depends on how many people we have. If, we've, if it's a little bit more animate, we may have a huge flower arrangement. It kind of depends on how many people are, are coming. And uh, we always try to make it special. We bring out votive lights for later on. And uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid the mosquitoes are such that we always have to bring out the coils and light those too. <laughs> One of my favorite main dishes is bass chicken. My cousin brought it back from Spain, I guess almost 30 years ago. And we had it with sangria. And it's been kind of a staple. And uh, it has those special flavors of the Basque country. And love the tomatoes and the peppers and the chicken and the, the wine. And the, of course, the olives are what really give it that extra special flavor. Jill says she's not a dessert maker, but uh, she really can uh, whip up some pretty special uh, things at times. And uh, for a party here not too long ago, she fixed up a cobbler combination with fresh blueberries, fresh raspberries, and fresh peaches. And then she had a biscuit on top and then served it with French uh, vanilla ice cream. There wasn't a calorie in it, and the cholesterol was, was very low. But, <laughs> oh, talk about heavenly. Just absolutely heavenly. you to come early so that I could share the garden with you. It's just elegant, even more lovely than the first time I came. I love the way the flocks has taken off. Yeah, you see, now I, I sort of consider this peak when the flocks are like that and the mandevillas are really beginning to get loads of their pink flowers. And, and it's this time of night, the blue is just, just luminous. Are we going to have a toast? A toast. To gardening? To garden and gardening. I think so. Visit the Perennial Gardener with Karen Strobine on the web.
Log on to PBS online at www.pbs.org. To order this episode of The Perennial Gardener with Karen Strobein or the entire 13-part series, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This program is made possible in part by Garden.com, gardening for today's world. Additional funding was provided by Friends of Iowa Public Television. This is PBS. This is your statewide public television network, University of North Carolina Television. On December 31st, the Earth will make one monumental rotation and touch off a once-in-a-thousand-years celebration. And you can see it all, live, from quiet ceremony to crowded streets. It's midnight live from every time zone. You've never seen anything like it, because no one's ever tried anything like it. Be there. PBS Millennium 2000. Around the world. Around the clock. All day, Friday, December 31st, here on UNC-TV. Your financial support and the support of viewers like you make possible the quality programs you see on UNC-TV, North Carolina's statewide public television network. To volunteer. What's it about? It's about having fun. It's about being part of a team. It's about making new friends. It's about knowing that what we do makes a difference. It's about being a part of your statewide community. It's about giving support where support is needed and appreciate it. It's about being a UNC TV volunteer. Call 919-549-7125 and find out how easy it is to become a UNC TV volunteer during Festival 2000 this coming March. Call 919-549-7125 today. Perhaps the most famous Christmas present of all is the Nutcracker. And this year, it's a gift from the Joffrey Ballet of Chicago to you. Come along with Clara on her magical Christmas adventure in the Joffrey Nutcracker. Tonight at 9, only on UNC-TV. Oh, no Tune in for a good old-fashioned country Christmas celebration with Arthur Smith and the whole gang. Don Ainge. Von Mann. The Cockman family. David Dietz. Brian Arrowwood and Arthur's special guest, Roy Clark. It's Arthur Smith's Carolina Christmas. Coming Saturday, December 25th, here on UNC-TV. From cooking to crafts, woodworking to gardening, UNC-TV brings North Carolinians the best in how-to programs. Learning for a lifetime on your statewide public television network, UNC-TV. UNC-TV gratefully acknowledges the support of Carolina Gardener magazine, written by and for gardeners in the Southeast, delivering quality information and advice. Sample copies available.